This week I'd like to review this book. It's a new English translation of the Septuagint from Oxford University Press. It's nine and three sixteenths inches tall, six and seven sixteenths inches wide, and one and a half inches thick. In a second we'll compare it in dimensions to a couple of other books. The back of it, as you can see, it's a shiny hardback. Here is the ISBN. In terms of other books, this is the uh, Westminster Reference Bible from Trinitarian Bible Societies. It's a bit thinner than the Westminster, a little taller, and about the same width, perhaps just a hair wider. Compare it to a couple of other Septuagints. Here's the uh, Thompson Septuagint that used to be avail available from Shekinah Enterprises. And the Shekinah is a thicker book, but not as tall and not as wide. And this is the one that's most available and probably most widely known. This is Brunton's Septuagint. Brunton's is taller, thicker, and the same width, just about. It, uh, on the interior, it's formatted in two text columns. Each column is 65 millimeters wide. There are about 52 characters per column, and I count as many as 64 lines of text per column. The page dimensions are 227 tall, 158 wide, so that converts to 8.94 inches tall, 6.22 inches wide. As you can see, the print, the print is crisp but sometimes it's not quite as dark as it could be. Here, for instance, it strikes me as being more of a dark gray. The uh, text is not quite line matched everywhere, although it is accidentally in some places. So I think you can see here that the print on the opposite side of the page is not quite lined up with the print on the facing side. The uh, margins at the top, I get 14 to 15 millimeters at the bottom. Let's see, on a page which actually comes down to the bottom, about uh, 9 to 11. The inner can be as much as 13, not nearly that much here. The outer margin is in the range of 8 to 10 millimeters. Remember, there are about 25 millimeters to an inch if you want to do the conversion. Font in the text, I compare it to Times New Roman, and I get about 8.5 for uppercase letters, like this A. Lowercase is more like a nine point. That disparity is very typical for Bible fonts. The uh, compared to Times New Roman, the lowercase letters tend to be larger than they are in Times New Roman, proportionately to the capitals. The uh, line height is three point one eight millimeters, and that's about nine points. So that works pretty well. I think the line spacing is definitely adequate in this Bible. Verse numbers, as you see, are within the paragraphs. Added words uh, that the translators add for clarity are not an italic font in this Bible. There are notes at the bottom of the page. These are typically translation notes. They explain terms. They are in a 7.5 point font. And unlike the text itself, which is formatted into two columns, they span the entire width of the page. Let's talk about the paper. I measure the sheet thickness to be 43.6 micrometers, and I estimate the paper weight to be 39 GSM. There's a very light sheen on the paper, and I'll see if I can show you that. I think if you look at the black letters. You can see some reflectivity from the ink. There's some pattern reflectivity from the waxiness on the surface as well, but it's not especially bad. The paper is uh, white with a slight yellow tinge, and there is only moderate show through. So even though this isn't printed as darkly as it could be, I don't have a lot of problem myself with show through here because it's also faintly coming through the paper. There's some print non-uniformity. Let's look at a couple of pages side by side. I've marked 448 and 449 for comparison. So if you look at these two, 448 on the left, 
and 449 on the right, that gives you a sense for the variation. Left clearly is lighter than the right page. Uh, there are book introductions. Book introductions, let's see if we can find one rapidly. Here's the book introduction to Esther. The column is 135 millimeters wide. Uh, there are about 105 characters in the column and it's in the same font as the Bible text itself. The um, page book titles are in the center top. The uh, page contents are alongside the book title. So Ju Judith chapter 8 is on that page. Chapters 7 and 8 are on this page. Page numbers are in the outside top of the paper. Ideally you'd prefer to have the book title out here so that you can flip, flip rapidly to the book that you want. Title uh, chapter numbers should be out there as well. There are no headings as you can see, no headings at all in the text. Chapter numbers are large and bold. Books of the Bible generally begin on a separate page uh, but here in the Minor Prophets they do not. So here we're in Hosea and then you see Amos comes in right here in the middle of the page. The uh, final book here is Daniel and they include Bell and the Dragon. And the, at the end of that you will find six blank sheets of paper plus a piece of heavier paper cardstock. There are no maps, no concordance, no ribbon marker. Um, there are black head and tail bands. I don't know how well you can see that there. But there are head and tail bands in the book. Um, it's a sewn binding. It lies open and fairly flat in Genesis. Uh, if you open it towards the center of the book you'll see that the text does tend to curl down into the gutter. So this is one of those where you have to manipulate it if you want to be able to read it flat. You have to essentially read it two-handed or use something to force the book up on one side, on the opposite side of the page that you want to be reading. The front again, front is similar. We have what's called a half leaf here. First title page and then second title page with the editor's names. Oxford University Press. Here's the copyright page. Copyright 2007. And uh, printing in, printed in the United States of America. This is the first edition, I think. Contents. Books of the Septuagint. Books of the Law, the Five, the Books of the Torah, and Histories, including four books of Maccabees. Uh, Judith and Tobit are here. First and Second Asdras. Poetic books. Prophetic books. We've seen the Twelve Minor Prophets. Ending with Bell and the Dragons, which starts on page 1023. List of abbreviations. Abbreviations of the books of the Bible. Abbreviations used in the notes here, like FEM for feminine, PL for plural. More abbreviations used in the introductions. And then to the reader, which is a several page introduction. And then you come to Genesis. So if we go back to, to the reader, we'll see that the Greek text that follows is the Göttingen Septuagint in, Eng in English form. Um, that's what they call their translations, the Göttingen Septuagint that they're translating. Um, we're available, it's been based on that, and we're not available, they've used Ralph's manual edition for the remainder of the book. They also note that the book of Odes is not included, um, but 
everything else essentially from the Book of Odes is included in various other locations except for the prayer of Manassas which they append to the end of the Psalter. Now we'll do some font comparisons uh, first just briefly. Um, as we mentioned the font seems an adequate size. It's printed crisply, perhaps not as darkly as it could be in places. Line spacing looks adequate. Uh, for my taste the column is too wide but it is uh, not so wide as to make it not useful. Can't complain too much about it. First book I'll bring over is uh, Thompson's Septuagint. And as you can see, Thompson's is much larger and darker print. In my opinion, Thompson's is not as literal of a translation as either Brenton's or NETS, but I've seen comments on the internet from people who disagree with me. Um, I'll bring over next the standard copy of Brenton's. This is the one with both the Greek and the English text printed in, in uh, side by side columns. And so Brenton is coming in from the right. It will pop right, there it comes. And so NETS is quite a bit larger than Brenton's. It seems to be printed more evenly to this this seems to have gaps in the letters from places to places like in this s just above my finger but uh, both are actually readable this is not as readable as it could be and so some people um, have printed the english text only of brenton's and that's available at lulu.com we'll bring that over next so this is a large print english only edition of Brenton's, which is available at lulu.com. Now I'm going to bring over the NETS from the right so that we can compare the fonts. And so if you want a larger print, um, copy of the Septuagint and you're not concerned about having Brenton's Greek text as well, then this is available. It's only available in paperback and it's a quite large book. I think it's um, at least 10 inches tall. Uh, I measured it. It's eight and eight uh, and a half inches wide and 11 inches tall. But this is the English only, available at lulu.com. So it's large and bulky. But if you're interested in a large, larger print Septuagint, this is certainly available to you. And it does seem to have all of Brenton's translation notes as well. It's just missing the Greek. The uh, NETS is based on the New Revised Standard Version. They translated from the Greek, but they kind of used the New Revised Standard Version as a base. So you would anticipate that, would, they, that it would be re uh, reflecting a gender-neutral translation philosophy like you find in the New Revised Standard Version. But in fact, it's not always that way. For instance, here at Psalm 4.2, the New Revised Standard Version has, How long, you people, shall my honor suffer shame? Um, but that's clearly a, a modification to what was in the original Hebrew there. If we look at the American Standard Version, which is a very literal translation of Psalm 4.2, you see, O ye sons of men, how long shall my glory be turned into dishonor? So, you have the gender neutralization there, sons of men became you people. But uh, here, in the NETS, it's you sons of men, how long will you be dull-witted? So it didn't turn it into you people. That uh, is in keeping with the Greek itself, which you see here in Brenton's. Brenton has you sons of men. And that is exactly what the Greek says underneath my thumb. I forgot to mention earlier that the interior design and typesetting is done by Blue Heron Bookcraft of Battleground, Washington. We hear a lot about 2K Denmark these days, but Blue Heron Bookcraft has done quite a lot of good work. To give you a sense for the flavor of the translation, I'm going to attempt to read it from this distance. And you can read Brenton at the same time. Brenton is based essentially on uh, 
a King James type style, whereas the NETS uh, started off life as the New Revised Standard Version, so it'll appear much more modern, at least it should. I'll read here, beginning in verse 1. In the beginning God made the heaven and the earth, yet the earth was invisible and unformed, and darkness was over the abyss, and a divine wind was being carried along over the water, and God said, Let light come into being, and light came into being, and God saw the light, that it was good, and God separated between the light and between the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and it came to be evening, and it came to be morning, day one. So just a few observations here. Um, NETS replaced unsightly and unfurnished with invisible and un unformed. Um, the deep with the abyss. I like the abyss better. Uh, the Spirit of God with a divine wind. I personally prefer Spirit of God. Um, and where Brenton has an asterisk to give the literal leading, reading for Between the Light and the Darkness. Um, the NETS actually includes it in the text. It reads a bit more awkwardly there, Between the Light and Between the Darkness, but that's a more literal translation here than here. We'll back up now to take a closer look at the Table of Contents. In addition to the five books of Moses, we have Joshua, Judges, Ruth, then first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles, and then the two books of Esdras, um, Esther, Judith, Tobit, and the four books of Maccabees, uh, the Psalms, Prayer of Manassas, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, Job, Wisdom of Solomon, Wisdom of uh, Jesus, Son of Sirach, Psalms of Solomon, then the Twelve Minor Prophets, followed by Isaiah, Jeremiah, Baruch, Lamentations, the Letter of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Susanna, Daniel, and Bell and the Dragon, in that order. Now it seems to me, as far as I can tell, that that order is the same as the order here in the Table of Contents to Ralph's Septuagint. Oh, um, you may have been puzzled by first and second Esdras in that list. Second Esdras in the Septuagint is Ezra. The first ten chapters of second Esdras are Ezra, and then the following chapters, 11 through 23, are Nehemiah. The introduction here explains the relationship and the parallels between first and second Esdras. They are one pair of double traditions found in Septuagint collections and they represent material from the Hebrew Aramaic, Aramaic Second Chronicles, Ezra, and Nehemiah. I find these uh, introductions useful. Here's the one to First and Second Supplements. That is First and Second Chronicles, the NET translation of First and Second Supplements, Greek Paralipomena, uh, the 70 title of the Hebrew books, is based on Ralph's. So they tell you which edition of the Greek text they've translated, the translation profile of the Greek to include the general character of it. You can pause to read any of that you like. So they talk about various examples. They give you the Masoretic, the Septuagint that they've translated, their translation, and then compare that with the New Revised Standard Version. And continuing, so we're still in the general character. This is the NETS translation of supplements, their, their approach to the translation. Selective words and phrases, problems of grammar. And it continues until here. And then we're into uh, First Chronicles. A uh, number of these books in the NETS uh, are translated from two different sources. For instance, here in Tobit, there are translations from what Robert Hanhart, the editor of the Greek text, calls G1 and G2, the longer form. 
And so when you go over to Tobit, you see in fact two translations, the longer form on the left and the shorter on the right. Um, similarly in Daniel, we'll get there rapidly, in Daniel you have both the Old Greek, the Septuagint, and Theodosian's translation, and you have those in parallel columns. And I think you're seeing some of the sheen that I talked about right through there. So in terms of English translations of the Septuagint, uh, this is the only modern one that I know of at the moment. In um, November, November 13, on the Amazon website, um, the Lexham English Septuagint, a new translation, is going to be available, which apparently is translated from Sweet's edition of the Septuagint. It would be a 19th century edition. Um, but your choices right now, until November, are the NETS. I wish they hadn't used the word new in their titling, um, because a hundred years from now it's going to seem quite odd. Um, but your choices are NETS, uh, the Chan Thompson translation, and Brenton's. Um, Brenton's has the advantage of giving you the Greek alongside, but it's printed very small and in very small characters. Um, both of these, Thompson and Brenton, are in archaic King James style English, at least they use thou's and thy's. Um, this I think is a very good translation, it's very useful, it's a very interesting volume with a lot of information in the uh, introductions. I think it's laid out quite well, produced well. There are a few things that I would have done differently, like move the text farther out of the gutter and use darker ink than this, perhaps had more narrow columns. But all, all in all, it's quite readable and very useful. Well, I hope you enjoyed this uh, brief introduction, overview of the New English Translation of the Septuagint. Thanks very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, remember to hit the like button. And if you haven't already done so and so are so inclined, please subscribe to the channel. Thank you.